everyone, Amy, Nala, and Kiara here with Skellig. And in this video, we're going to be talking about how you can identify a 3.0 architecture so you can avoid it when building your new facility. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, that's a silly video. If I'm building a new facility, it's going to use the latest versions of everything on the market. So surely it's 4.0 ready. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Skellig is a life science systems integrator, and I cannot tell you how many times we have had requests for proposals or RFPs come in that say, hey, we're gonna build a cutting edge facility, factory of the future, we're gonna be top 10 in the world. And then within the same RFP, list out technology and architecture from 20 years ago. And when I phrase it like that, everybody agrees, this seems absurd and contradictory. So why is this happening? And I think it comes down to two things. One, life sciences is extremely regulated. We are all best buds with the FDA, and so we have a very strong culture of preserve precedence. If the FDA liked it once, surely the FDA will like it again. And second, the people who are putting these bids out, I think genuinely don't realize they're putting out an inferior plan. I think the people who fall into this group don't even know they're in this group. And I sympathize. When I saw a crazy RFP like this, I went to the website of the technologies listed because I was wondering, what do these people think they're buying? And oh my gosh, it, it clicked. The marketing on these websites is phenomenal. I saw everything that I wanted to hear when I think Industry 4.0. I saw we're going to destroy data silos. It's going to be completely integrated. We're going to help you with your digital transformation. All of these claims on technologies that I know cannot do this at scale. And that's a big problem. So how do we fix it? I could give you a list of here are all the technologies I think are awesome. And here are the ones I would stay far away from. But that creates two problems. First, that relies on you to take my word for it and just listen to people on the internet to tell you how to think. That's not great. And second, what's awesome today may or may not be awesome five or 10 years from now. So what I really need is for you to have the skills to be able to identify what to stay away from and to do this without needing to be a systems architect. Because the way the world is right now, people at the top don't have time to get into the weeds of the technology. And so the way I want to do this is with a little exercise. I'm going to give you the most convincing 3.0 sales pitch that I can. My goal is to steel man the 3.0 sales pitch and replicate all of the marketing that you're probably hearing today. And during it, I want you to think, does this sound convincing? Could this have tricked me? After, I'm going to arm you with two questions you can ask that will detect 90% of all 3.0 architectures, regardless of whatever marketing ploys they try to throw at you. And I'll explain how these questions work. Okay, so here we go. Here's the pitch. Hey there, I heard you're building a new plant. First step, of course, is to pick your equipment and its corresponding automation control. You know, you could do it the old way and go grab some PLCs, but life science is all batch driven. You really need to view, monitor, and coordinate multiple pieces of equipment per batch. That's going to be real difficult if you have a variety of PLCs from different vendors, because you can end up with different control softwares and completely different libraries. One PLC might call it Bioreactor 1, and the other one might be called PBR2. That's going to cause a lot of headaches in your digital factory. How are you going to compare trends if you have different naming conventions? And forget about using that messy data in any cloud computing. Instead, what you need is a DCS system. With a DCS system, you're going to have one cohesive software layer across multiple high-speed, high-quality controllers. And the big advantage there is you're going to have data consistency across all your equipment because everything is going to be using the same one standard library. Second, we're going to natively integrate into the rest of your plant. So our control system actually comes with a phenomenal ISA 88 21 CFR Part 11 compliant batch engine. It also integrates with a compliant NES system. So we're talking digital batch records, electronic signatures, audit trails, everything the FDA has seen before and wants to see again. And in our commitment to integration and openness, our latest version actually supports OPC. So you can then historize your data from our control software into one of the most popular historians on the market. All in all, with the DCS sim, you get the confidence you're gonna have high quality process control, it's FDA compliant, and you're going to get that completely integrated factory of the future with no data silos. And if you want, you can easily connect with adapters into your ERP or cloud to do any kind of AI or machine learning or analytics with it. Please contact one of our sales associates to help you digitally transform. And end sales pitch. Now, to me, that sounds like a 4.0 factory. I didn't hear any red flags. 
again, everything I said are things that I'm seeing on their websites, but the sales pitch, the websites, they're crafty. They say all the right buzzwords, but leave out the key criteria for if this will actually work at scale. And the good news is you only need to ask two questions to identify a 3.0 solution, regardless of the marketing. The first one is, does the architecture rely primarily on discrete connections to transfer data? So a discrete connection means that I'm just gonna pipe data directly from point A to point B. A real simple analogy is sending a direct email. If I need to email 10 people, I need to know all 10 email addresses to make the 10 discrete messages. And it doesn't scale, because if I need to email 100 people, I now have to do 100 emails, 100 discrete connections. And the second question was, is the data in the system closed? So what I mean by that is, can the data be shared over common protocols? If it is, then it's open. If it uses any custom proprietary connectors, then it's closed. And a word of warning, be cautious about if something claims to be open just by saying it's OPC compatible. Something Skellig has been running into with lab equipment is it might claim it uses OPC, but there are a lot of caveats to if you can actually access the server. You might only be able to use it if the equipment is in a certain mode or if it has a special connector hooked up. Or in other cases, you can only use it if you buy an excessive amount of OPC licenses. When I say open, I mean no strings attached, just out of the box over common standard, pro over common standard protocols, I can access that data. If the answers to these questions are the ar architecture is discrete and closed, it's 3.0. And I no longer care what they have to say about 4.0 tools like AI or machine learning or digital plant because they don't have the infrastructure to support it. So let me show you why. Right here is our traditional 3.0 discrete architecture. The one that just sounded so, so lovely in the pitch, but this fails both questions. It is discrete and it is closed. Let's talk about closed first. If a software is closed, it will bring in data, but not readily share it back out. And something that I left out in the sales pitch is this hypothetical historian has tons of connectors to bring data in and do some analysis for you, but it will not readily share that analysis back out. And data is the most valuable commodity you have. You don't want it to get trapped in some closed system where you're at the mercy of that company to say what you can and can't do with your data. If in the future I want to use five tools to analyze or view that data, I don't want to five times need to get permissions from my historian to see if that's okay. If you want your business to grow and adapt, you cannot have closed 3.0 systems gatekeeping how your data applications expand. Another symptom of a closed software is it will share data, but only with other proprietary software. So then you get trapped in what is known as a vendor lockdown. One example here is this hypothetical batch engine. This batch engine only does recipe control handshakes with exactly one brand of DCF software that, by the way, only runs on one brand of controllers. That batch engine also only integrates nicely with one specific MES system. So if you're drawn to that batch engine, you may find yourself inadvertently buying into an entire automation stack because it's designed to work just within its closed vendor specific circle. And that hurts you, the manufacturer, because now you don't get to pick best in class solutions and you're at the mercy of whatever licensing costs they want to run at you because you have no other choice. And the biggest issue with vendor lockdown is you will never have all your needs met within one ecosystem, especially when you think about CDMOs, gene therapy. Those manufacturers have a hard enough time just finding that obscure lab equipment, let alone trying to get all of it from one vendor. But even just general life science manufacturing is going to have this problem because right now, single use is all the rage. And that includes single use bioreactors and single use wave rockers. As we all know, the single use wave rockers on the market today usually come with their own custom control. They are not going to be controlled by your DCS system. Now, in this 3.0 architecture, to get any visibility or communication to send batch set points to this wave rocker, there's only one thing to do and that's to make the landing module in my DCS and start piping data point by point into it. And this brings us to the second question of, is it discreetly connected or not? Discrete connections don't work. They are time and consuming effort. For every control module, set point, visualization that already exists in the wave, 
if I want to be able to see it from my connected DCS system, I'm going to have to recreate it over here. And on top of that, because I'm increasing the version of my configuration, we now have to test and validate it. We all know how much work that entails, but for fun, let's run through it. I'm going to have to update a design spec, get that peer reviewed by another automation person. Then I'm going to make a test protocol, get that peer reviewed again by an automation person, this time maybe including CSV, quality, QA. Then I'm going to execute the test protocol, get it technically post approved. I'm going to import the code to production, which requires yet another form, some signatures, get the code downloaded, get that download peer reviewed, get that code released with another form to maybe automation CSV CQV QA. Then I'm going to route the DS for post approval, route the test protocol for post approval, route the change control for post approval. All of that process involves like five people, three days worth of work, and for what? All we did was get data that was already digitized here, re-digitized here, just so I can see it in my interconnected DCS plan. And we haven't even started the work to configure the rest of the speed set points to the equipment. The point is, in life sciences, every time we have to engineer a discrete connection just to transfer data, it's a significant amount of time and money to get that validated and implemented. And since it's so much effort, only the minimum amount of data points are going to be transferred. Every line here shows that discrete connection, and the bar shows the percentage of data transferred. And you can see, not surprisingly, we have data loss into the DCS and into the historian, because again, we're manually making tags in the historian and connecting them. Oh, and here's the thing too. Even if you have a fancy tool to expedite the historian tag process, 3.0 architecture still has data loss because of the vendor lockdown licensing fees. Historical tags could either be so expensive you can't afford to historize them all, or maybe you get unlimited. Okay, then you get hit again with the licensing cost it gets just to get your data out of that closed DCS system. And that doesn't do you any favors when you're trying to later troubleshoot root, call inve root cause investigations for deviations and quality control. And this pattern continues. Data is only passed to the system directly above it through a very expensive discrete connection. So less and less real-time data makes it up the stack. So much so that most 3.0 ERP systems are not linked to any real-time plant floor data, which is a shame because the plant floor, that's what's making you your money. Instead, what you end up having is perpetually outdated and reactive ERP systems. People end up relying on Excel sheets to track the status of batches, and you just have daily scrum meetings just to update the Excel sheets. If we go back to that sales pitch, they can claim you can have an interconnected facility because technically speaking, it is possible to drag a set point up the automation stack and then throw it into whatever in the cloud. But is it financially feasible to do this? Absolutely not. There's too much documentation and validation in pharma. And don't take my word for it, the FDA thinks so too. During COVID, the FDA realized that life science manufacturing supply chain was extremely fragile. There was a big movement to make it more robust by incorporating industry 4.0 tech like artificial intelligence and machine learning. There was a partnership with NIST to accelerate implementation and millions of dollars in grants for research. And what they found was that a lot of people failed at incorporating this technology. And not surprisingly, the two biggest obstacles were legacy systems, and insufficient funding. And this doesn't surprise me at all. AI and machine learning need two things. They need massive amounts of data and for it to be clean. So first, you cannot have this data and context lost as you climb up the stack. You're not going to have enough training data. And then second, that data needs to be cleaned, which means it's normalized, complete, and structured. And you don't have that data here. Data is not complete. A lot of it gets left behind. It's not contextualized and structured because there's no coordination between the systems. And look, right off the bat, I have two different names for the same one wave reactor asset. And who knows what that thing is going to be called in my MES systems and ERPs. They're probably all named differently across all systems. How is AI ML going to train on this messy data? It's not. Instead, you're going to be paying some poor data scientist to spend most of his time and your budget cleaning data instead of getting insights. When we go back and we think about how there's this culture of preserve precedents, we all understand now that the 3.0 architecture is not a precedence worth preserving. From this day forward, I hope to never hear or see of an RFP again that asks for a 3.0 plant. If we can do that, oh my gosh, the industry has just moved forward a giant step. 
And the good news is you don't need to be a systems engineer to save your company from making this mistake. All you need to do is ask the engineer proposing this architecture, hey, does this have discrete connections? Is the data open or closed? If it's discrete and closed, just don't do it. Now, hopefully, lots of people just threw out their terrible bids and they're wondering, okay, if I'm not doing this, what should I be doing? And the answer is you should be pursuing a unified namespace architecture. What that is and how that helps life sciences will be covered in the next video. And then the last two videos, four and five of the series, are going to be completely devoted to the demo architecture and walkthrough. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope to see you soon.